Welcome back to this week's episode of The Goonery, episode 90, I believe. This week on the show, uh, we're going to be getting into some baseball discussion with our White Sox, my White Sox, Brandon's Cardinals, and then what's been a pretty crazy week in wrestling news, if you ask me. But before we get into baseball, Brandon, how are you doing? I'm good, man. Can't complain. I got a first place baseball team, which I'm going to touch on a little bit later, but can't complain. I'm, I'm, I'm living. Yeah, let's just get right into that. I mean, we talked the last time, uh, last episode we did. Obviously, we were in very different places mentally with our baseball teams. You were happy with the Cardinals. We were talking about how great uh, Paul Goldschmidt's been and how Adam Wainwright is just continuing to amaze us. And the Cardinals now, first place, sole possession of first place in the Central. And, I mean, it's going to be either them or the Brewers, so why not separate themselves right now? I have to be very, very careful here because usually when I get into these little modes of hyping up my team saying like, you know, we're on a pretty good run. I think, you know, if, if we can separate ourselves from the Brewers, then we're, we're going to make the playoffs. We're going to make noise in the playoffs. But let me be very, very cautious because I feel like this is thing that happens. Whenever I hype up my teams and they, you know, and I, I say all these glowing things about them, they turn out to embarrass me. So I want to just stay composed and not jump too quick into thinking that we are legitimately legitimate contenders in the National League. But let's talk about the here and now. Right now, the Cardinals are in first place. And that is a direct result, result of the, the Cardinals playing some damn good baseball after they got, they got swept by the Rays last week and then they bounced back perfectly against the the Reds three games up on the Pirates right now we're we're losing at the moment but taking three or four not the worst thing in the world we're going to Boston this week and that's going to be a very 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 big challenge for us but how could you not be happy with what you're seeing granted Cardinals have these moments when they it seems like they can't hit and and I think one of those things we have to just realize as baseball fans that your team is not going to hit every night. The pitching is better. The everyone's throwing hard nowadays, and it you really can't get upset. So that's why whenever I I, I say like, damn, the Cardinals stink tonight. I have to think back to the the you know the night they they scored nine runs or they scored twelve runs, fifteen runs. At the point. At this point, their offense has showed up, and this is just a far cry from what they've been the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. So when you see guys like Goldschmidt just absolutely tearing the cover off the ball, Tommy Edmond leading off, Harrison Bader is finally, finally showing improvements in the hitting department. And the scary thing is, no Ronaldo has gotten hot yet. Tyler O'Neill hasn't even gotten hot yet. So what's the limit for this team? Like, what is, what is, what is the limit? Yep. And it's scary to think that these guys, you know, a lot of the star players haven't even gotten going yet, but what if they do? What if they do? What if the pitching staff comes back into form? What if Jack Flaherty comes back and is, is the best pitcher? And you're going on top of Adam Wainwright, Miles Michael, and Steven Max isn't even back yet. It's hard not to be excited right now. And, and that's why I can't be completely that person to be like, yeah, I'm happy, but I want to wait. This team is exciting to watch. And I, I'd rather just enjoy it instead of just being like, I'm on the edge. But I'm torn in between. And I think these next two weeks are going to say a lot about how the Cardinals are going to go into the second half. Because, I mean, Boston, at Boston, that's never easy. I don't care how hit and miss, how up and down the Red Sox have been this year. It's not easy to win in Fenway Park. After that, you got the Brewers on the road, which, I mean, again, it just it, – it depends what Brewers you're going to get. And yep. the Brewers – I would take the Brewers staff over the majority of staffs in baseball, if you ask I me. I agree. But their lineup does not scare me at all. Not one bit. And in my opinion, that lineup is just – a lot of guys and yeah that's it makes no sense I mean pitching obviously carries you in October in my opinion and if the Brewers get there they're gonna be hard to beat in a series with that staff but we saw how it happened last year with them as well but then after the Brewers you got the Cubs which I mean the Cubs are flat out garbage and people are finally come to terms with that in Chicago and then the Marlins after that to wrap up June and 
the Marlins are a sneaky wild card team, in my opinion. And I mean that that whole NL East is a sneaky wild card team, in my opinion, between them, the Phillies, and the Braves. I mean, I what did the, the the Braves and the Phillies combined to go like twenty and one to start June or something like that, which is I think so. asinine. I mean, that's that's unheard of. And let's say the Cardinals play five hundred ball in these next two weeks. Are you ha- you're happy with that? I would assume, right? Depends. Yeah, yeah I, the, 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 I, I think my biggest judgment will come off the ball, the Boston series. And this is a team that historically they've struggled with. Mm-hmm. Whenever any league play goes to Boston, Boston comes to us. It, it's it's kind of been a struggle. So winning at Fenway is one of the hardest things to do. And yep. that's that's why whenever someone comes to take two or three, three or four, or even sweeps them, you're shocked. Because it's like Boston has one of those crowds where you're just like, damn, like that's a crowd that could that could win a playoff series by themselves. Oh yeah. So I will reserve my judgment until that Boston series. But 500 ball is not bad, but you would like you would like to be over 500 with that. And I think that's a possibility, in my opinion. I think that's a very good possibility. I mean, like hopping into my White Sox, just talking about last time on the show, I talked about how scared I was after Tim Anderson going down with the schedule they had in front of them where they had – You know, they were on the road in Tampa. They ended up winning that series, surprisingly. And they lost lost two or three to the Dodgers, where they very easily could have won Um, all three of those games, in my opinion. We'll get into that a little bit. And then they lost very winnable, a win a very winnable series to the Rangers as well. But then they just swept Detroit. So, I mean, it. But the worst series for the Sox, in my opinion, this year has been against the Red Sox at home a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Red Sox hung 16 on them two of the three games. And one of those games had Dylan Cease on the mound. And that would scare me as a Cardinal fan, because in my opinion, I think Cease has better shit than anyone the Cardinals have on their staff at this point. But end of the day, look what they've been doing with the guys that they have in their pitching staff. They're in first place. They have 37 wins. and they're just playing good baseball, good flat out baseball. And I can't say that about my team and I'm jealous of you. <laughs> but I, I, I will say this though. We haven't addressed the elephant in the room. Last night, I thought I was going to see something historic. And two times in my fandom of being a, uh, in my Cardinals fandom, been a fan since 2004. And I saw Michael Walker on two separate occasions be one and two outs away from a no-hitter only for it to be broken. The heartbreak that I had watching Michaelis lose that no-hitter, and I'll be the first to tell you, me, I used to crap on Miles Michaelis. After that Cy Young candidate, yeah, he had, I believe, in 2019. I think that was 19, yeah. Yeah. I was, I was like, yeah, he peaked. And, and, and you know what? This is not one of those mosaic moves where he goes to Japan to get a guy and says, yeah, if, if it pans out, say, I'm smarter than you. I'm smarter than every fan. But Michaelis has showed me something this year. Damn the no-hitter for a minute. It hurt, but I'll get over it. The fact is, he has been the best, the most consistent pitcher for the Cardinals. And this is a pitching staff that... If you go outside of him, Wainwright, Helsley, Cabrera, it leaves a lot to be desired. Yeah. It leaves a whole lot to be desired. So the fact that we're at 37 wins is pretty damn good. The only thing I'm worried about is the fact that we are a winning baseball team at the moment. And we sit on our hands at the yeah, deadline complacent. thinking that everything is sweet, everything is cool, and we, you know, we don't need to make any other moves. I'm going to tell you something right now. The pitching staff, while healthy, it could be good, but you need some arms in that bullpen. I mean, yeah. Nick Wiggren and and, Kyle, and Drew Verhig is not going to win your World Series championship. Hell, it might not even win you a Central Division championship. So... That just me knowing how the Cardinals operate, that's the only thing that scares me, that they're not going to make a move and we're just going to be content with being good, but not great. Yeah. And I mean, I feel like that is something that both of our teams can kind of relate to at the deadline. 
with the Sox last year going out and their big moves were getting Cesar Hernandez and um, Ryan Tapera to sure up the pen. Tapera ended up being good and Craig Kimbrell, who ended up turning into AJ Pollock this offseason, which whatever. But that's the thing. Like, I would be scared of that too as a fan because the Cardinals are obviously an incomplete team with their bullpen. They are. And bullpen arms at the end of the day, they're the first thing to go at the trade deadline because they're expendable as bad as it sounds they're expendable and they're cheap i don't know how the cardinals farm system is but they'd be fools to not shore that bullpen up after the all-star break and for your sake and your sanity i really 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 hope that they don't let this first half trick them into being complacent and you know what they need to take into account how did we get into the wild card last year we played a team. We basically eliminated or had a part in eliminating a team that seemed complete on paper. And I'm talking about those San Diego Padres. They yeah. seemed complete on paper. When San Diego came into St. Louis, fans was like, all right, we'll be looking to take two or three. I remember the Padres had swept the Cardinals early in that season. And then... They came into San Diego. They, they came into St. Louis, and we absolutely mopped the floor with them. Mm-hmm. Mopped the floor with them. And what happened after that? They got complacent. They had no chance of making the playoffs because they just lost focus. This is got this has got to be a year where you got to make that splash move like they did in 09, getting Matt Holiday. Or, or even in the offseason, getting Goldschmidt or, or Arenado. This has to be the time because you want to send Molina, Pujols, and Wayne right out on uh, the, the biggest notes. You, you don't mm-hmm. want to just win a central championship. You don't want to just go to the NLC. Yes, you want to send them out with a World Series. You make sure you make the moves to get them back because that's going to be the most I, – I, 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 this, this may not be a bold claim. You win a World Series this year if you're the Cardinals. This is the most memorable season than any season in the past 25 years think about that i'm i'm not i'm not questioning that i mean the fact that pool host is back molina is still there adam wainwright is still there kicking i i mean it just it doesn't make sense that those three guys are contributors at it's insane in in 2022 (laughs) on a first place team in the middle of june and again i know it's only the middle of june but albert pool host sucked his last few years like flat out sucked yeah i'm not saying he's great this year but he at least looks competent again he looks better he than looks what competent. people expected that and that's literally all we need he's a bench bat at this point yeah. that's all we needed and he's selling tickets and bringing people into the stadium and he's fun i mean the cardinals are fun i mean yeah. like, it, i've seen more social media interaction with the Cardinals than I would say the majority of base major league baseball teams this year. And a, a lot of that goes back to Yadier Molina and Albert Pulos both pitching and both somehow having a 36 ERA and people love position players pitching. And it's just gone under the radar. How good the Cardinals have been this year too. It's so crazy how it works when the Cubs aren't good, how much press the Cardinals magically get all of a sudden? I mean, like, we're talking about yesterday with the base running from uh, Nolan Gorman. And the the stir, like, even if there are idiots in baseball who don't understand why that was such a heads-up play, how smart it was, it got people talking. Even if they're playing the Pirates, the Pirates are terrible. But the fact end, that of the day, end of the day, they're still a major league baseball team. That's the thing that I will always go back to. I don't care how low their payroll is, how, who's on their team. End of the day, it's a major league baseball team, and you can never, it's never easy to go in and win three games, three, four games, and sweep a series. I agree. The only thing that I will somewhat disagree is they, it could be a minor league team mass to MLB team. Cause, because yes. if you looked yes. at, if you looked at the Cubs lineup over the week, cause I was at the Yankee game, Yankees and Cubs at, on Saturday. Was that and the, I, put up 18? 
No, I missed that one. I, I And I'm like, damn. But I was there to see Judge hit two home runs, Stan hit a home run, Trevino hit a home run. It was cool. I was being the biggest hater in the crowd because, like, you know, I was just being <laughs> mass as a Yankee fan. But I was like, yo, I'm drunk as hell. I'm having a good time. The Cubs are losing. How, I mean, what else could I want? But, but, yes, the Cubs lineup is something that you're just like, damn, this team won a championship five years ago? Yeah. Damn. <laughs> yeah crazy yeah it's it, it is crazy to look at and cup fans that i that i am friends with family with they uh they honestly took it, that run for granted because they expected more and as crazy as that sounds because they had a 108 year world series drought they were happy with it they were over the moon about it obviously but i don't think they enjoyed it as much as they should and could have because just in their mind, they're like, oh, we have one or two more at least. At least. And everyone else kind of thought that too with the talent they had. And that just seems to be a common trend with Chicago baseball these the last decade with the Cubs and now my White Sox, who still have a 77-year-old drunk, senile Tony LaRusa at the helm as the manager. And we're going to bring this back to the Dodgers series because it is, in my opinion, become one of the most outrageous baseball stories in quite some time. So Tony LaRusa, for those of you unaware, decided to walk Trey Turner on a one and two count intentional walk. Just, you know, send him to first base. And Bennett Souza, the pitcher on the mound for the Sox at the time, he has on the entire White Sox staff the highest slugging percentage against lefties. And that is as a lefty. So what do you do? You're intentionally walking Trey Turner on a one and two count to bring up Max Muncy, a left-handed hitter in the four hole who has the highest slugging percentage as a lefty against lefties in major league baseball. And what do you know? Max Muncy puts one in the seats and the Sox lose the game. And I'm not saying that's the only reason they lost that game, but the fire Tony chance started. They started in, against LA they kept going in the Rangers series and the Sox have magically seen consistent lineups since that started Tony has after defending the intentional walk to Trey Turner Tony has been I would say a little bit more understanding of the mistakes and I bet that comes down to getting a talking to from Rick Hahn Kenny Williams and if I'm being completely honest, probably Jerry Reinsdorf, because that's the only person who really matters when it comes to the White Sox, as bad as it sounds. Yep. And should Tony La Russa be fired? Yeah, absolutely. He should be. Will he be fired? No, because Jerry Reinsdorf is as loyal as loyal comes. He, Kenny Williams should have been out of the White Sox organization a very long time ago, but he is still some type of senior advisor because Jerry is loyal to a fault with his guys. I mean, you saw what happened with John Paxton. He hit a big three-point shot in the 90s for the Bulls, and he ran the Bulls into the ground, and he finally, finally just got him to step down as the general manager this past year, and he still is a senior consultant to the general manager because he doesn't want to get rid of him and take him off the payroll. And I just don't think Jerry Reinsdorf wants to have his team fire Tony La Russa again. It's one of his good friends. But with the way this season has shook out, I really do think that this is the last year we will see Tony La Russa in a dugout. And I pray to whatever God is up there that that is the truth. And it, it's just, it's frustrating. And I know the Sox are rolling into what is the easiest schedule in Major League Baseball from here on out. I saw the Twins beat up on competition all throughout this season so far. And it's the Sox turn. And they took advantage of it in Detroit these last three days, three game sweep put up 13 runs today on the Tigers and Yohan Moncada had five, he went five for six today, five hits. He had seven hits on the entire year coming into today. I didn't know that. I mean, he, he was on the IL for a while. Oh, okay. he, no, no, he, he, but he came back in mid May. Okay. That's still bad. Out of, um, out of, um, the qualified major league hitters with at least 90 plate appearances. There's this random guy 
who I follow, I'm, who's a White Sox fan, if you're listening to this, if you want obscure stats, follow Jay Kuda on Twitter. I don't know how this man has time to find some of these stats. This is an absurd one. But out of qualified major league hitters with at least 90 plate appearances, as of, I think, like two days ago, Yoan Moncada was last in batting average, on base percentage, slugging percentage. Out of all qualified hitters, Yoan Moncada was a guy who was a number one prospect in baseball at one point, was, was heralded as this 25, 25, potentially 30, 30 guy who plays gold glove defense at third base, which he does. There's no denying the defense he plays at third base. He's an absolute vacuum. And in 2019, he got MVP votes. He got 20, he got MVP votes in 2019, but then 2020, he fell off a little bit. Last year he had COVID and ever since he just has really not been the same. And a lot of White Sox fans really don't like Mankato because he, uh, He's notorious for um, going to Northwest Indiana, uh, hitting up the strip clubs, hitting up the of uh, the bars in Northwest Indiana, and he's notorious for preying on eighteen to twenty two year old suburban girls. So there there are some uh, off the field things with Mankata where people wonder if it's really in his heart's really in it because he got that big contract. And since he signed that big contract, he's just taken a a giant shit on the field since then, especially in the batter's box. And I don't want to attribute that to the off field stuff because I don't think anyone wants to suck. If we're being completely honest, I would like to think that it's a physical thing at this point, long, long long-term effects from COVID potentially not being fully healed from his oblique injury at the beginning of this year. But I saw him today for the first time I can remember this entire season smile in the dugout after hitting a three-run homer in the first inning this afternoon. And the way the dugout reacted, they were treating him like he was a rookie who got his first home run after giving him the silent treatment when he came into the dugout. And I don't know if there's something deeper going on with Yohan Moncada, but he had a double and a homer today and or it might have been two doubles in a homer today and he had a double yesterday the, the switch might be turning and if that's the case thank the lord because this offense has needed it i mean jose Abreu has been as hot as any hitter in baseball i don't know how much you paid attention to it but since the middle of may he is second in all of major league baseball on walks and when you have an offense that has luis robert who does not walk at all he has Monty Grandall, whose walks are lower than ever before, and now he's hurt. Moncada, who typically walks a lot and is not walking at all. That matters. I mean, yep. getting on base matters, and there's a lot of guys who are stepping up, too, with injuries. I mean, Andrew Vaughn has been incredibly consistent this entire year. Sneaky all-star candidate, if you ask me. He's hitting above 300. And my favorite stat about Andrew Vaughn is that after today – he is 11 for 24 on 02 counts this year. Cool. I mean, as a second, having your second full year in the majors and you're have that type of discipline and just poise at the plate in those type of situations, I think that says a lot. And then you had Jake Berger, who's been up and down these last few years, White Sox 2017 first round pick. He spent a lot of time in Charlotte this year in AAA, and he is leading the White Sox in home runs. And he, he can't play third base, but he has a place in this lineup this year, as a, whether it's a DH. I don't know how it's going to work when Eloy Jimenez comes back, but he needs to get at bats, plain and simple. And then Danny Mendick, our back, he's been another guy like Berger, up and down between AAA these past few years. Anderson goes down. He's hitting over 300. He's hitting over 300 since Tim's gone down. He has three homers and he's playing solid defense. He will be the White Sox second baseman for the rest of the year in about two weeks when Josh Harrison gets DFA'd and Tim Anderson is fully healthy and back. And are brighter things in the future for the Sox? I I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, it's hard to tell because they went into Detroit and they did exactly what they should have done. I mean, Detroit, I saw something they have the lowest team either on base percentage or slugging percentage 
at this point in the year of any team since like 1947 or something like that. Like it's a historically bad offense. And it's scary because this was a team that I believe they have the record for losses um, in a single season. This is back in 2003. I believe so. so. So if let's just say if that were to be the case in this year, because you think you got teams like the Orioles and the, the lesser degree, the Royals athletics are, are rebuilding and you have a lot of teams that you would think that would be like on a real, real like incline. You thought because like I was one of those people that that said, watch out for the Tigers this year. They're going to be building this year. They're not. They're not going to be as bad as people thought. I didn't think it was going to make the playoffs, but I thought I didn't. I didn't think it was going to be this bad. I was more scared of the Tigers right. than any team in the AL Central coming I, into this year. And that is completely legit, completely because the, they got they have the farm system to trade anybody and to develop those guys too. So mm-hmm. scary, very very scary. But I will say this: this is going back to the Tony Russo thing. As you know, Tony Rusa has a place in my heart because he was the manager of the Cardinals and both of their World Series that I had, I witnessed. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to play the old man on, on the lawn with this. It was an analytical move to walk Trey Turner on a one-two count. Analytics helps very, very much in baseball. I think anybody would be a fool to think that it doesn't. <laughs> But at what point does a line get drawn in playing a game that is all mental? I it bothers me so much that like in this <laughs> this rant might go like completely different direction because you got lineup switches, you got who to walk on this on this count and. Where is the, the times where people whip with their gut just to make a decision? Why yeah. is everything coming from up above? I think we had this discussion where there are people who don't even run their team as a manager. They're all being told by people who work in an analytical office, uh, office who would probably never play the game of baseball, but they know every number possible. Tony La Russa, you would think, right? You would think he is a guy that... He bangs to the beat of his own drum. You would think that's for sure. That's for sure. Exactly. So to make an analytical move at his big ass age with the with the gut filled with all types of beer and whiskey, you don't have the gut to make that move. You don't have the gut to say, screw the analytics. I'm gonna do what I think is right. And you to go and double down on it because they said, listen, the doubling I, down was the worst part, in my opinion. That that was by far the worst part. I mean. He was talking down to these reporters like they were idiots. And part of me really thinks, like, it, d- deep down, I do not think there's any form of analytic that tells you to walk someone on a one and two count. I mean, I don't care what the analytics say. Any person who is smart enough to run those analytics will know, will know at the end of the day that, that those are, of course, just numbers. You look at the reality of a situation. It's one and two. You don't need to walk him. I think that legitimately comes down to Tony thinking he's smarter than everyone. And that has been the biggest problem with him as the manager since coming back. And he just, I, I'm just at a loss for words that I'm complaining about a 77 year old Tony La Russa in what is supposed to be a world series contention year for the white Sox. And they, in, as each day passes, this White Sox rebuild looks like more and more of a failure where the peak is going to be one AL division series win, not even a series win, one, winning one game. Yeah. And you know what? The only outlier at this moment in time is Buck Show Wilson, what he's doing with the Mets. Yep. Great, great start. Is it sustainable? Probably. They have the talent to sustain that success. Now, going forward, you're probably going to be like, okay, well, like, you got to be a little bit more careful. But I think there's a very, very distinct difference between Buck Showalter and Tony La Russa. And I think there's, this, is a, this is an issue. And I think this is not just a baseball issue. This is a life issue. What I mean by that is this. You have people in your life, family, uh, family, friends, 
people that you meet on the street, and they could be much older than you, probably by 30, 40 years. And if you tell them your opinion about something, they'll be like, no, that's wrong. And this is my opinion. Boy, well, wait, I thought all opinions are just opinions. That, there's no proof behind it. Point being is this. There's a lot of older people who think that they're smarter than every other person that's mm-hmm. alive. So when, when you are hiring a manager, hiring a head coach, you are you're like I, like you have to take that to account. You have to make people relate to what you are trying to convey. Because if not, your all your messages are going to fall on deaf ears. It might work for the first year because it's like okay, we got a new guy in here, we got a new voice. You know, maybe we're going to you know things are going to work out. And then more and more and more and more, you see it's more of the high my way or the highway, and that's no player, no player wants to hear that from anybody so if the white Sox want to keep on with these old ass managers and and not make an effort to be relatable to players they're going to fail but it's funny that i bring that up because i saw someone on twitter mentioning that ozzy Guillen should be the guy for the white Sox again and i quoted it because he said that he specifically singled out Tim Anderson. And I said, let me ask you a question. What I'm curious, what, what does Tim Anderson need help Anderson need help with? Defense. Okay. He's not that good defensively. Cool. Whatever. Uh, but but let, me, let me get into that real quick, real quick, not to interrupt you. Tim Anderson, I believe, has made nine errors this entire year, right? Mm-hmm. Six of those have come in two games. They've been isolated incidents. If you really look at his defense. It's been two really bad games, and then the rest of the year it's been average to slightly above average. Mm-hmm. And there's always going to be outliers, but go on, go on. Yeah, so – and he said, do you like Tim Anderson's defense? Oh, Tim Madison, can, can he not boot baseballs? I'm like, well, first of all, you're being an asshole with your response. That's first and foremost. But, but him being singled out is crazy to me. The White Sox have a lot of issues, and I watch from afar. Tim they have Anderson. a lot of issues. And you're just talking on a guy that's on the injured list right now. And not for nothing, they are not doing as good because he's not on the field. And when Tim he's, and he's the, the most field, important player to the Chicago White Sox. By there, far. There was by no far. doubt in my mind. Every year when he's gotten hurt, they, they sputter a little bit. And when he comes back, there's like a flip switches. And just like that, he's the stop, straw that stirs the drink. And I, I, I like – uh, to a lesser extent, I kind of think Lance Lynn was that guy too. Because yeah, I, don't I agree. Know, I mean, I don't know if you saw the video of him getting into it with uh, the White Sox third base coach the other night during his start. No, I didn't. Oh, they were in the dugout screaming at each other because McEwing's the infield coach for the Sox yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. And it had to do with like ship positioning and like an easy ground ball getting through whatever. Mm-hmm. And since then, Sox defense has been playing pretty great. The offense has been firing mm-hmm. on all cylinders. And I don't know if they just needed that type of energy back in the clubhouse. But in the post-game, uh, post-game press conference that day, someone asked Lance Lynn what the argument was about. And Lance Lynn is very vocal <laughs> about uh, how he said he wishes he came to Chicago earlier in his career because everyone does nothing but eat ribeyes and drink Goose Island IPAs, and he loves that. And he said that him and McEwing were arguing about why – their favorite cuts of steak. He said, I'm more of a ribeye and potatoes guy. Joe McEwing's more of a filet and Caesar salad guy. And I told him that's a shame. And that's what he put that off as was the argument. But it's just, uh, it's, I, I don't even know. It's just so, I, I'm very interested to see how these next couple of weeks are going to go because Tim Anderson rehab assignment is going on in Charlotte right now. Eloy Jimenez rehabbing, Copex injury isn't bad thankfully um and of course now kyle hendricks is on the il our 64 million dollar closer with the forearm strain which ultimately always leads to uh tommy john but i'm not sure if you saw this either liam hendricks interview came out today he's been pitching with a torn ucl since 2008 2008 i think he's gonna say 2018 oh my god that's what 14 years ago that's insane. He's been I mean, successful. He's been successful. Baseball players are really a different breed. They, I mean, really, they, are. They, they really are. But I look at that as 
were the Sox really dumb enough to sign a power pitcher for $64 million? I don't care how good he's been knowing he has a torn UCL. That's, that's, that's insane. Like, that's literally insane. I mean, and he says he's not worried about it. And you know what? I'm going to trust that crazy bastard because he's been picking <laughs> with it for 14 years. But it's like, what the hell, man? Like, it's just like the White Sox are a circus. And it's just like every day I wake up and I'm thinking, what is the White Sox official Twitter page going to tweet out today as a roster move or whatever that I can be laughed at for by my friends or by the rest of the <laughs> And hopefully that turns around. But speaking of uh, someone else that's been being laughed at by the internet today, Vince McMahon constantly <laughs> in the news. What is he, 76 years old? And it has come out that he is now being investigated by the WWE Board of Directors for um, reportedly paying off and having a former WWE employee sign an NDA disclosing an affair that the two had. I mean, am I surprised? Yeah, kind of. But, like, am I shocked that, like, no, not at all. Like, I think I'm more surprised that this has come out, but I'm not shocked that it happened. If that makes any sense, it makes perfect sense. I'm, who are we talking about here? I, <sighs> Linda McMahon is a strong woman. She be, she can go to hell as far as I'm concerned, but she's a strong woman. She has endured a lot of Vince's nonsense. Because I'm pretty sure this is this isn't the first time. Pretty sure Vince no, has done a not lot the last of, either. Yeah, it won't be the last. If that man is, that man would be on a wheelchair and he will whistle at one of those young blondes on the roster. Like, that's just who he is. But we don't know the details. I don't want to be that guy. Oh, no. But the detail that gets me the most is John Laurinaitis getting yeah, him on the action. And I don't know if this is, pro- this is common knowledge for a lot of people, but John Laurinaitis is married to the mother of the Bella Twins. So just imagine if Bree and Nikki make their return or if they, if they will make their return because now things are very, very awkward. But just if this isn't the most white billionaire story. Oh, yeah. I mean. That's the perfect way to describe it. I mean, if we're being completely honest, it's like something you would see out of like an HBO TV show. Yeah. And it's. It's just like you like feel bad for everyone involved, but at the end of the day, it's like you're the one who did it. I mean, and I really want to know, I mean, like how something like this comes out because obvious, well, I, we obviously know who, how, and this came out most likely, but you wonder what is the reason that it's come out now more than anything. And I think it's coming at an interesting time too been some interesting moves with the McMahons. I mean, Stephanie McMahon was quietly kind of relieved of her duties with WWE. Triple H is no longer with WWE. And now it looks like Vince is on the way out. And probably a sale sale coming, a sale coming. Nick Khan is going to be the guy taking over. He's going to sell that baby right away. Oh, and I don't blame right him. Right away. And I don't blame him. <laughs> I mean, who would it? He's going to get billions from Disney. And you know what? I, I'll, I'll say this much. The one thing that's going to annoy me about this story, and like like you said, all parties involved, it's, a, it's an absolutely crappy situation. But how much you want to bet? Some way, somehow, it's going to be made into a a war of, of shows. Mm-hmm. Tony Khan would never do that. My king would never. My king re- respects women. He may treat Thunder Rosa like shit, but he loves women. I'm not prepared for it. I'm not prepared for it at all. And you know what? I'm surprised that there has even been a lot of discourse between, well, he doesn't do this, but he does this, but y'all still watch him. I don't want to hear it. I don't. I don't. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, on the topic of AEW too, obviously we kind of want to talk about this. Jeff Hardy, unfortunately arrested for his third DUI in four or five years, excuse me. And it came out that he blew a 
0.294 with the legal limit in Florida being a 0.008, which, I mean, obviously Jeff Hardy is someone who's had his issues for as long as I can remember. I mean, I remember being seven, eight years old and being on WWE.com then having to ask my my dad what crystal meth was when I find out that <laughs> Jeff Hardy was suspended for it from the WWE. And I was like, Dad, what is this? Seven years old or whatever I was. And I mean, it's just, it, it's sad. It's, I mean, it's not a laughing matter. I mean, obviously people were criticizing WWE for how they let Jeff Hardy go and offering to give him assistance and him turning it down. And I mean, I, we like to dump on Tony Khan on this show a lot, and rightfully so, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. But I think the way they're handling the situation is good. Hopefully it works. Yeah. I mean, suspended without pay until he completes rehab. And I don't know what he means by demonstrates that he can maintain sobriety. I don't know how long that'll last. But it's not like Jeff Hart. Like, end of the day, I don't think Jeff Hart is a bad person. I mean, addiction is a disease at the end of the day. Yeah. And – if he hasn't been able to kick it at this point, I, I don't know if he ever will be able to, unfortunately. And it, it's a shame. I mean, and you know he's probably doing it because of how much pain his body is in from the absolute destruction he's done to himself the last 20-plus years for every ours and everyone else's entertainment at home. And it just – it sucks to see. I have to ask this question. Who is Jeff Hardy's support system? Who is the the person or the people around him that continues to convince him that he could still go, continues to convince him that the fans still want to see him? And granted, we're like this with every guy that is considered a legend in this business that's still wrestling to this day, Mm -hmm. that we want to see them. We want to continue to see them. And when when they're gone, like, yeah, we're going to miss them. Like, I, I don't ever want them to go. But he can't continue to wrestle Dude, I'm, I'm just gonna say it neither of the hardys man neither of them can walk without a limp now and you know what i was just about to bring that up too matt hardy might be the biggest support system of jeff hardy but what is that really saying matt hardy has been through a lot of shit not as much as jeff hardy but he's been through a lot and not for nothing like there was a reason why Matt Hardy was medically disqualified at one point in, in, in his career. I don't know how he got that clearance to come back, but clearly someone isn't doing their job. And the problem is that it's us. And I'm not saying like me and you, but it's us. Us continue to clamor for any return the Hardys have. This isn't just about Jeff. This is about Matt too, because they, they honestly, it seems like they come, they, they come in a package deal. Yeah. What when when one goes, the other goes, and vice versa. It, it happens all the time. But at what point are people going to tell him stop wrestling? Does he need to kill somebody in order for someone to get the message? That's the that's the issue. It, he could kill somebody or he could kill himself. And then what will be the discussion? If Jeff Hardy were to kill himself or kill somebody, what will be the discussion? Damn, we should have stopped him a long time ago. We, 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 we tried to help and we really did, but he didn't listen to us. No, you're not trying. That's the problem. Mm-hmm. And I get the whole idea of AEW paying for the rehab and you know suspending him until he could get himself right. But at what cost and what has told you in his history that he will stay on, on the straight and narrow? You can't take that risk. You can't allow your company to have that type of bad press if he does harm somebody or he does harm himself. And it's just like the way I look at it, as cool as their WrestleMania return was, watching the bolt of them waddle down the ramp at WrestleMania, what was that? WrestleMania 34, 33, <laughs> 34, something like that. But like watching them waddle down the ramp, that was like that first moment where I was like, holy shit, yes. like, what are they doing? And then, I mean, Jeff can't even do a Swanton bomb anymore without landing directly on top of who he's hitting it on because his tailbone and his hip is so bad. He can't do the twist of fate how he used to do it anymore because it hurts him too much. 
And yet he's out there on a random episode of AEW Wednesday Night Dynamite doing a swanton bond to Darby Allen off a, off a ladder through a table. And I just don't know how you can consciously pr- produce that match. It's, it's so irresponsible. And I'm not even going to talk about that particular match. One of the match I'm going to talk about, this, the match is actually happening tonight. There was supposed to be a, a triple threat ladder match. They were going to win that match. They were going to win that match. Exactly. They were going to win that match. But you're going to put that man into a match when at double or nothing, it came out that Thursday. He didn't remember the match. He didn't remember. How was that not... It, it sounds to me that people don't learn their lesson with wrestling. Yeah. You want to know the, the, the most horrible, and I hate to bring this up because it's 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 it feels irresponsible to do, to do this, but it needs to be said just so it won't ever happen again. Chris Benoit was worked to death. Okay. It, it, it was, and I know the whole thing with depression and and with Eddie Guerrero passing away and him losing his best friend combined with the concussions and 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 all, all the injuries he had, he did something horrific. I'm not going to sit here and say the same things I have with Jeff Hardy, but you need to have your wrestlers in one piece after retirement because let's let's keep it real. I know AEW is you know they perceive themselves to be the progressive company, but. Are they going to be continue to pay his hospital bills after retirement? I don't think so. No, no one, no company wants to do that. No. So at what point do you pull the plug on Jeff Hardy and say, we're not going to hire you anymore? Like you're, you're, you're only going to kill yourself if you keep wrestling. And the problem with that too is obviously like these big companies that whether it's AEW, WWE, New Japan, I mean, I guess you can kind of throw impact in there. Just people with TV deals, I guess you could say. They're, they can be told by whatever media company they are broadcasting on to not sign them. But they can these guys can still go to independent shows and wrestle as much as they want. Yeah. Ric Flair was cleared to wrestle in the, the next month. That, that, he's going to die. He will yeah. die in the ring, and he's going he's gonna to like it. Yeah. And like, it's sad to say. But there's just so many of those guys in the business right now who just need to stop. The Hardys. Edge shouldn't be wrestling anymore. Neither should Brian Danielson, Daniel Bryan, in my opinion, just for all the issues they've had with their neck. I mean, you could go on and on. Samoa Joe probably shouldn't be wrestling either. Oh, yeah. He's one. He's another one. Um, who else? Christian. C- Christian. Sting. Like Sting should it, not be wrestling. Like it just like it goes on and on. And if the Undertaker comes back and wrestles another match. I will I, also. I, I mean, I mean that that'll be ridiculous. The fact that Shawn Michaels came out of retirement and wrestled another match, it's just it, it's sickening because they know that these guys are going to make them money, and at the end of the day, that's all that matters to them. Yep. And it, it, something bad is going to happen again. That that's as blunt of a way to put it. And oh, real quick, talking about the support system of Jeff Hardy. Mm. You you know what I'm about to bring up. I know. I know. The TikTok that Rebby Hardy put out, Matt Hardy's wife, if she's saying that, I have a really strong feeling that Matt Hardy probably feels the exact same way. I want to agree with you so badly, but I also feel and Matt Hardy seems like a good guy, but he seems like the biggest pushover. Listen, he's more pussy whipped than any person I think I've ever seen in the history of the internet. And you know what? He probably he probably learned his lesson that you know I, I didn't do that with Lita, and I, and I got cheated on. So maybe if I do that with Rebby, it'll work out. But besides the point, Rebby Hardy, people need to talk about her being like one of the most heinous heinous people that like wrestling has yeah. to offer and just this occasion because addiction is not a joke it's not something to laugh at it's not anything that should be touched especially 
from somebody whose family you married into. Like, think about having a nerve to do that. That's crazy. Yeah. And then her mocking Ashley Massaro committing suicide because all because him, her and Matt used to date. Like they were at anything at that time of her passing. It is crazy to me how there is obviously no accountability for her. And it doesn't, the yeah. accountability doesn't even, need, doesn't even need to come from her friends. It needs to come from a damn husband. He needs to stop being a pussy and, and put her ass in check. Because why are you, why does she feel comfortable in the first place posting that about her about his ailing brother in a, in a, in a time of need where he's clearly, clearly he needs a good support system around him. And that's the route you go to. Even if you are angry at him for continuing to make the same mistakes or even or if it, it's even mistakes at this point, why is that the first thing that you go to? Why to, to be me, to be to yeah. have vitriol in your soul? Why? Like, why is that? I don't know. Like she she's she's a terrible person. Horrible. Yeah. Yeah. But to uh, kind of wrap up the show on a, a bit more positive note, because obviously that I mean that was that was a depressing conversation and no doubt about it. But I kind of want to talk about uh, just the state of Roman Reigns and being the unified universal champion, whatever the hell they're calling him at this point, his very limited schedule. He's only scheduled to work one Monday Night Raw this entire summer, which, you know, it's a problem in my opinion. And I get that Roman is, in my opinion, I don't even feel like wrong saying this. He is the biggest star in the industry right now. Correct. And I don't even think it's close, quite close at this point. And I get that they're trying to make him into a special attraction. But you can't have both of your world titles gone for an entire summer. So that's why I don't know how they would do it. But I really, really, really hope Seth Rollins wins the money in the bank, takes the WWE title off of Roman somehow at money in the bank. If he's even going to be on that match card, I don't know if he is. And you have Seth just run with the belt until WrestleMania because you know, you, you know what's going to end up happening if Seth becomes WWE champion. It's unfortunate. He deserves a run with the belt. But at this point, I really do think if he wins the title, he is holding that until WrestleMania and Cody Rhodes is going over him at Mania. Correct. And it's not a matter of if, but when with Cody being the world champion in WWE now after his performance at Hell in a Cell. I mean, mm -hmm. that was unbelievable. I know you're not yeah, the biggest yeah. fan of Cody, but testament to both of those guys. I mean, Seth Rollins for being as good of a worker as he is and Cody Rhodes feeling comfortable enough with a fully torn peck to go in there. And not that I take Dave Meltzer's star ratings for anything. I mean, they don't matter. But that was the first five-star match WWE main roster's gotten since Money in the Bank 2011 with Cena and Punk. And, I mean, there's no doubt in my mind now who the big three in the WWE are, are moving forward, men's-wise at least. Yeah, I mean, it's Roman, Seth, and Cody. And you know what? By the way, we're going to have a discussion about <clears throat> people uh, taking – Dave Meltzer's ratings two cents. We're gonna have a conversation about that one day. Oh, there's a but, certain certain subsection of wrestling fans who tend to take him as gospel, which is which is hilarious. But I won't even go there. We're gonna say that for a different show. But um, Seth is the clear choice to win Money in the Bank. It's like, now, yeah. it's funny to me how I, <laughs> I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think they completely took away that stipulation of if you win Money in the Bank, you're gonna win the Royal Rumble. Because that sounded like to me, because Cody was the, the poster child of that. That sounded like to me that that was supposed to be Cody's way of winning the Money in the Bank and getting that title match. Yep. Now he's going to win the Royal Rumble and do it the traditional way. Cool. That's how it should have been. But the real question is this. How in the hell are you going to separate the titles? Or if you are, what's next? One Monday Night Raw, <laughs> one Monday Night Raw till Money in the Bank or SummerSlam. A Money in the Bank, Money in the Bank. Okay, so that's, that's yeah, we don't we have till August with SummerSlam. Right. So he's gonna come back. I'm hearing that Randy Orton's gonna be next. Big match, big attraction. 
I want to see how they do the storyline because it's a big match, but have your return on pay-per-view for that is something I am, I'm cool on, but I don't feel like it's that big of a deal. But maybe my mind will change um, after the match with Riddle on Friday. But And hear me out. I know they want to set up a Reigns and Orton program, and I don't think there's any possible way it happens. But the same, like, what if Randy Orton interferes and Riddle wins the match on Randy Orton interference, starting the pro, uh, program with Randy and Roman? I mean, like, I, I would love it. I, 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 I want my dude. <laughs> no, and I, that's why I just wish it was for just the WWE Championship because I know they're they, they really want to do the Rock and Roman for the Universal Title at WrestleMania. But in my opinion, that doesn't even need the fucking title belt. It does not. Not at all. Not and at all. No one would complain about that main event thing, even if it doesn't have the title. Yep. So I know that the last couple of shows we've been talking, last few months we've been talking on this show, both of us have been very vocal about wanting Roman to just run roughshod for God knows how long. I am now, and I know this is me being just a wrestling fan and changing my mind every fucking week, but... I wouldn't, I mean, I'm not going to be upset if he holds on to the belt, but I would enjoy it if they swerved us for once. And I mean, that would be the biggest moment, I would say, on a SmackDown episode since Eddie Guerrero being Brock. Yeah. I mean, honestly. That's, you know what? I'm open to it. Because... I, like I said, I think I said this a couple of shows ago. With Riddle, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of what. Do the star. Do the star. They, and you know what? WWE has done an incredible job building him up. Like they have legitimately made him feel like he's a main event star. Good for them. Good for them. But should it happen Friday? No. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to say it should have happened Friday. But the, the time I would have it happen is only if he's taking it off of Orton or he's battling Orton for it, that type of thing. Yeah, That's yeah. why I'm I open mean, to I the idea. Agree. I'm open to the idea of um of a triple threat rather than a uh, one-on-one with Orton because truth, truth be told, uh, Randy Orton is, is really good in big matches and I think Roman Reigns is incredible in big matches, but does their style uh, really would make a bona fide great main event for SummerSlam? I'm not too sure about that. I'm really not. So adding that piece in Riddle, where I think would really, really make things incredibly interesting. And maybe, just maybe, if they say, screw the, the whole aspect of having unified championships, what if they split the titles? What if you know, they come up with a way to to defend the WWE Championship rather than the Universal Championship. All I know is I want those titles to not be unified. That's all I care about. So we'll see. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how these next few weeks shape out. If Roman Reigns is even going to be on the card at Money in the Bank, as crazy as that sounds. And it's going to be a good summer of wrestling though i think and yeah. we can be thankful for that definitely but on that note that's going to wrap up this week's show hopefully uh next week we'll be back to discuss either roman reigns retaining riddle winning the title and whatever else happens this week in wrestling baseball whatever else is to come basketball too basketball too yes yeah, here's gonna be wrapping up And don't forget to like, share, subscribe to the show. Leave us a review if you're on Apple Podcasts. And we will see you guys next week.